Let's turn now to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hanavi. This is an, a 30 minute uh, look at um, a topic uh, that's related to my Shema study that I conducted over the last three years. It's an apologetic course where we're looking at studies and topics, uh, particularly verses that are supplied and wrestled back and forth between uh, Trinitarians and Biblical Unitarians. I'm only focusing on the Biblical Unitarian uh, denominational group. And as I mentioned in the past, uh, Biblical Unitarianism is a denominational group that differs from generic uni uh, Unitarian Universalists in that they both have a non-Trinitarian perspective when it comes to God, right? They both believe that there's that God is a that is God is numerically one, and that He's not triune in his persons. He's singular in his persons. There's one God, there's one person. And yet, the biblical Unitarian differs from Unitarian Universalists in that the biblical Unitarian is a little bit more conservative in their views, and they're trying to root their perspectives back in the Bible. Thus, it's right in their name, biblical Unitarianism. They're seeking to be more biblically based in their understanding of God versus the um, Uni Unitarian Universalist um, denomination a little bit more liberal. They're they're not uh, shy of bringing in different comparative religious perspectives such as Buddhism, Judaism, uh, non, non uh, rabbinic Judaism. Um, you know other uh, religious, uh, say uh, New Age uh, teachings and theology, and bringing them all to the table for discussion and believing that there's some benefit that they can gain by um, having kind of this. Um, comparative religious discussion and allowing all of those views to speak to what the Bible has to say or something to that effect. Um, so again, a little bit more liberal, um, less rooted in what the Bible says and more kind of allowing for just personal opinion and personal perspective. Um, Anthony Buzzard, who's one of the prominent spokesmen for uh, Unitarianism, is, I believe, a member of the Unitarian Universalist side of the house, not necessarily a biblical Unitarian like, say, um, John Shaneheit, I believe I'm saying his name right, Shaneheit or Shaneit, the gentleman that we're interacting with on biblical Unitarianism. So, now that you guys understand where we're coming from, of course, Trinitarianism, I'm coming from the Orthodox perspective, meaning the view that was uh, postulated and put forth and understood by the earliest of the Christian fathers and the Christian writers on this particular topic. Of course, this goes from first century into second, third, and fourth, and ongoing. That's what I mean by Orthodox Trinitarian. So we looked at Genesis 1 1 last week, and now let's turn to Genesis 1 26, which reads out of the KJV And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. All right, what I want to do first is simply read their answer, and then I'll go back and interact with their particular answer. All right, here's what they have to say Genesis 1 26 is used by many Trinitarians to say that God is a Trinity because of the words, quote, let us, end quote. Although this would be an acceptable way to understand God's saying if the plurality of God or the Trinity was defined anywhere else in scriptures, God is never called three or three and one, but is always defined as one. And we've got a reference to John 5, 44, 17, 3, and Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Thus, they say, we should seek to see if there is another explanation for God saying, let us, rather than concluding the opposite of what the scriptures explicitly teach. This is their answer again. This is my um, uh, presentation of their answer. Again, I, you know, as a biblical Trinitarian, I disagree with their assessment of the text, but we need, we need to read their ver their understanding so I can make sure I'm understanding where they're coming from, and then I'll provide my own answer to their answer. They go on to say that we should use the clear majority of scriptures to interpret the minority of confusing passages. They continue, although there are at least six different interpretations for what God means here, the let us is most likely referring to God speaking to his divine counsel, which is his counsel of spirit beings that God works with in ruling and running his creation. God's divine counsel is an important but not commonly understood part of scripture, so it deserves some explanation. So they're going to explain it for us. They go on to say, some of the biblical evidence for God having an inner counsel with, with, with whom he works is very clear. Psalm 89 verse 7 mentions God's divine counsel, and the word counsel is translated from the Hebrew word sod, 
which they say refers to a council, secret council, intimate council, circle, familiar friends, assembly, end quote. And also sometimes to the result, the results of the deliberation of a divine council. They go on to say, other verses also mention divine counsel, the sowed of God, such as Jeremiah 23, 18 and 22 and Job 15, 8. Um, and then they've got a quote, impressive evidence from the Old Testament and parallels from Mesopotamian and Canaanite mythology point to the idea of a heavenly court where plans are made and decisions rendered, end quote. I'm not sure exactly where that quote is from. It's probably Anthony Buzzard or one of their other um, big uh, uh, favorite uh authors that they seek support from. They go on to say, the divine counsel of God shows up with varying degrees of clarity in a number of verses in the Old Testament. While God supplies the power for what he does, he works in concert with his creation. They continue, when it comes to Genesis 1, let us make man in our image, many Trinitarians believe that God, and they've got God in quotes, work together with the other persons, and they've got persons in quotes, God worked together with the other persons in the Trinity when he created things, and they point to Genesis 1.26 as a proof text for their argument. Right? I fall into that camp. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Trinitarian. However, they say, many scholars acknowledge that this interpretation is erroneous. Uh, now they're going to quote one of their scholars, or not really one of their scholars, but a scholar that they fo believe finds agreement with their perspective. Recently, Michael Heiser, a Trinitarian theologian, right? That's interesting. A Trinitarian theologian has the following quote. Technical research in Hebrew grammar and exegesis has shown that the Trinity is not a coherent explanation. Seeing the Trinity in 126 is reading the New Testament back into the Old Testament, something that isn't the sound interpretive method. All right, Michael Heiser, as from the Unseen Realm, page 39. Biblical Unitarianism continues, although some theologians think that the uh, this use of us in Genesis 1 26 could be the plural of majesty, also called the plural of emphasis, where God uses the plural us to magnify himself. That is not the case here. They continue. Hebrew scholars, um, Hebrew scholars point out that there's no other example of a speaker using the plural while addressing himself as the one being spoken to. More to the point, however, is the work of recent Hebrew scholars showing that the plural of majesty applies to nouns but not verbs. And here's a quote again from Mr. Heiser. The plural of majesty does exist of nouns, but Genesis 126 is not about nouns. The issue is the verbal forms. And end quote, and that's Michael Heiser from the Unseen Realm again, page 39. And I'm going to read the original Hebrew as well as the original Greek from the Septuagint here in a moment. And we're going to focus on the verbs and see what um, see if Michael Heiser has some something uh, a point to be made. I, I'll just tell you in advance, he actually does have a point that's being made there. In Genesis 126, the verb make in the phrase let us make is plural. We're going to confirm this here in a moment. You always want to go back and verify. Uh, the verb form make in the, in the phrase let us make is plural, and so the us is not a plural of majesty. It is God speaking to others about making an mankind, right? In the normal sense of the word, it must be a plural because the verb is in the plural, so he must be speaking to a group of people. The most common objection to the us in Genesis 126 referring to angels is that Scripture attests that God made mankind. But God could easily have headed up a council with whom he conferred and afterward did the work they decided upon, right? That's kind of what the rabbinical perspective is that we're going to um, be made aware of here in a moment. Another objection to this is that God goes on to say after our image, right, let us make man in our image. So one might question how angels are in the image of God. And they give you their answer. Since Adam in his pre-fallen state was without sin and in the image of God, it is perfectly reasonable to assume angels in God's divine counsel were also created in the image of God and without sin. Therefore, in their conclusion, it presents no problem to say that humans were created after the image of God, and in brackets they say, and subsequently angels, end quote, in brackets, end of their answer. Okay, there's the biblical Unitarian answer to Genesis 126. God said, let us make man after our image. Let's go back and read um, the passage itself and begin to glean some perhaps better understanding of the passage that I believe can be um, rooted back in Trinitarian theology. But before we do that, let me just make you aware of some of my own resources that are available. 
if you go to my YouTube channel at um and in, in in YouTube land, I've got a video set of um five videos, and I think what I'll do is I'll upload all five of them as one video, one kind of, I think it's a, about a 20 or 30 minute video. I think I'll do that this time in conjunction with this particular uh, answer. So I'll put these two together or I'll just include it in this particular um, video answer here that's 30 minutes. So it means the whole video is gonna be a, bit, a little bit longer. But until that, until I upload that, what you can do is you can go to my Tor Observant Show More Myths Vote um, playlist and scroll down into the playlist until you see the thumbnails uh, a little farther down, you can see I'm scrolling now. Until you see the thumbnails that look like that. Um, can I zoom in on that for a second? Uh, the ones that say um, revisiting, I'm sorry, uh, revisiting Let Us Make Man in Our Image. Uh, those particular thumbnails. Um, and what you'll end up doing is finding um, the uh, uh, five videos uh, that are related to my answer to this particular um, passage about Genesis 126. Um, you know, God said, let us make man in our image. Uh, that's one resource that I could point you to. You could also go to my website at takesatour.com and look in the uh, look at the very top at all the uh, cluster link of um, commentaries and um, find the um, Torah Observant Shomer Mitzvot series and then find the excursus on who is God talking with in Genesis 126 and read through my commentary there. That's available on my website. Um, what I want to do tonight, however, is I want to endorse a resource that I find helpful and I've always found helpful. I don't agree with everything they say on every topic and every question, but this time I think they hit the nose, the, 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 the they hit the nail right on the nose. Is that the right saying? Yeah. And, uh, it's gotquestions.org. Uh, they have a question is Jesus, the, the creator. And so in their answer, what they're going to supply for us is the Trinitarian answer to who was God talking with in Genesis 126 when he says, let us make man in our image. As you know, from a Trinitarian perspective, I do not believe God was conversing with the angels. I do not believe he was conferring with the heavenly council. And I certainly don't believe he was asking the angels, let us make man. And the reason I don't believe that is because he says, let us make. It's not just the us that's in focus. It is more important, like Dr. Heiser mentioned, it's the make part. Let us make, and God is the sole creator. Let me put a little graphic on the screen that shows you in post-production, that shows you that God is the sole creator when it comes to interpreting creatorship in the Bible. And under the label God, or Yahweh, if you will, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as given to us in the Bible uh, as attributing a uh, creatorship. But Everything else is on the other side is creation. So God is on one side of a chart, right? Let's call, let's draw a line vertically from top to bottom and separate a chart from left to right. And on the left side, let's put creator and we'll put God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And on the right side of the chart, we'll put creation. And that's basically everything else. And that's the way we interact with verses like let us make man in our image. It's because the Bible has already given us the answer. Now, yes, I realize it was a mystery at the time when Moshe wrote it. But that doesn't excuse us from not understanding that God did, in fact, in time, give us the answer to the mystery, that which was hidden, the mystery of, of, of God was hidden from mankind. So that doesn't mean that God suddenly became Trinitarian, right? He started out Unitarian as one God, one person, and then he morphed into a Trinitarian God with a triunity, when the revelation was revealed in the New Testament via the incarnation, et cetera, et cetera. That's certainly not the way we interact with the Bible. Let's look at God questions answer. I think I can read through their answer entirely. It's pretty short. Here's what they have to say about this particular issue about who was God conversing with in 126. I, I say it was Yeshua, or we could say it was the other members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because of the the um, New Testament passages uh, that we find that um, uh, clearly point to Yeshua as having creative authority, as well as those few passages that kind of hint that it was the Holy Spirit, like Job, where he talks about um, the Holy Spirit created me. But primarily, if, if, you, if you say Jesus was the one that God was talking to, you're not going to be wrong. Versus if you say it was the other members of the Trinity, you're still not wrong, but you're going to find more verses that talk about Yeshua being creator and all things created through him, et cetera, et cetera, then you are going to find verses on the Holy Spirit. So here's what God questions has to say. Genesis 1-1 says that God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, we looked at that last week. 
Then Colossians 1.16 gives the added detail that God created all things through Jesus Christ. The plain teaching of Scripture, therefore, is that Jesus is the creator of the universe. We could stop right there because Scripture is in our favor. As, as helpful as God quest, as, as of, um, Biblical Unitarian wants to be in their answer, right? If I go back and kind of interact with some of the things they said, they um, talk about how that there are other... Um, they mentioned how that there were other... Um, Mesopotamian and Canaanite mythologies that point to the idea of a heavenly court. Okay, that might be helpful from a historical perspective. Thank you, Biblical Unitarianism, for bringing that up for our discussion. However, do you really want to anchor your understanding of the Bible in ancient Mesopotamian and Canaanite mythology? Hello, right? Is that some final authority when it comes to interpreting the Bible? as if that can speak to the authoritative word of God? Certainly not. And I hope Biblical Unitarian's authorship is smarter than that to think that Mesopotamian and Canaanite mythology is going to help support what the Bible says or give further clarification or even some authoritative look at what the Bible says, right? What do we want to do when we're trying to understand the Bible? We want to turn to the Bible. And here's again where the Biblical Unitarian over and over again, the Biblical Unitarian perspective over and over again, seems to show their lack of understanding of using the Bible's authority. They fail in these two areas. Number one, they fail to use all of the Bible, right? Sola uh, tota scriptura. And they fail to use the Bible authoritatively. Sola scriptura, the Bible exclusively. So they're going to start pulling in um, Mesopotamian and Canaanite mythology to show how that God was speaking to a heavenly council. Are you going to trust what the ancient Canaanites and Mesopotamians had to say about God's speaking to their um, heavenly councils and courts? Or are you going to turn to the New Testament and find out what the writers of the New Testament, like John and Paul, had to say about the nature of God and when it comes to creatorship? Who are you going to trust? Right. So let's go back to um, uh, gotquestions.org. Uh, they continue, the mystery of the triune God is difficult to understand, yet is one of the doctrines revealed in, the script, in, in Scripture. Notice they're rooting their answer in Scripture. Over and over again, we want to root our answer in Scripture. In the Bible, both God the Father and Jesus are called shepherd, judge, and savior. Both are called the pierced one in the same verse, right? Zechariah 12.10. Christ is the exact representation of God the Father having the same nature, Hebrews 1.3. There's some sense in which everything the Father does, the Son and the Spirit also do, and vice versa. They are always in perfect agreement at every moment, and all three equal only one God, Deuteronomy 6.4. Knowing that Christ is God and has all the attributes of God aids our understanding of Jesus as the Creator. Make sense? Yeah, it must make sense because we're using the Bible. And contrary to what many biblical Unitarians are fond of doing, which is cherry-picking using the entire Old Testament and pitting it against the New Testament, I know they don't say they're doing that. I know they don't. But what they do is they, in, they, they, they inadvertently kind of default to, well, the Old Testament doesn't say that there's Trinity, so that means there must not be Trinity. Or the Old Testament doesn't seem to imply a person's in God, multiple persons, so therefore there must not be persons. As if the New Testament has nothing to speak to on the matter? Come on, please, let's look at the Bible in its entirety. We have it now. Yes, I realize it was a mystery in the time in the Old Testament. Yes, I realize it was Revelation being unfolded at the time that it was being given in the time period of the Tanakh. But, but, God knew from advance that the New Testament would become part of the Old Testament. It would be one. Com it would become one authoritative Bible, or one authoritative um, source of of um, scripture and understanding. And it's not as if God changed from being a unity into a Trinity from the time period of the Old Testament into the New Testament. And that's almost the kind of insinuation that biblical unitarianism makes when they say well we need to let the old testament speak to our understanding of god and that always what did they say um i think they even said default to the new testament let me let me pull that quote from heiser again um let's see uh blah 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 where is it um this would be a simple way of understanding god's never called oops sorry about that 
Never continue. That should seek the third another organization rather than conclude the opposite from scriptures. Uh, give me a second. I'm trying to find Heiser's quote um, where he talks about defaulting to, back to the New Testament. Um, ah, here we go. Heiser says, um, or them quoting Heiser. Uh, yeah, this is Heiser. Technical research in Hebrew grammar and exegesis has shown that the Trinity is not a coherent explanation. Dot, dot, dot. Seeing the Trinity in Genesis 126. You ready for this? Seeing the Trinity in Genesis 126 is reading the New Testament back into the Old Testament, something that isn't a sound interpretive method. Really, Dr. Heiser? Using the Old Testament to interpret the Old Testament is not a sound interpretive method? When was that ever accurate? Right? When you're reading the Old Testament and you find something that you don't quite understand, turn to the New Testament and seek for further elucidation or elaboration or um, revelation. And the reverse works. When you're reading through the New Testament and you find something that you don't fully understand, you should be turning to the Old Testament for further revelation and understanding. So absolutely, I'm not saying we should read into it, but we absolutely should be utilizing the New Testament to um, point us back to the Old Testament and using the Old Testament to point us forward to the New. It's that old adage again, the old is in the new contained, the old, the new is in the old explained. New is in the old explained. I think I got that right. I'll flash a little graphing on the screen that's accurate, but I think you guys have heard that before. So contrary to what Dr. Heiser is, I'm going to have to disagree with what he's trying to say there. Unless I'm misunderstanding his quote. But from my understanding, when we're talking about mysteries that God concealed in the Old Testament, right, like, like the mystery of God, but revealed in the New Testament, it is to our advantage and benefit that we use the Old Testament and the New Testament together to help support one another. Because in the end, it's one unified word of God. It's not old versus new, new versus old, right? That's a false dichotomy. That little page in your Bible that separates the old from the new, you need to rip that thing out. It's one unified word of God. And God was revealing himself progressively through history and through his word so that God expects us to take the most contemporary revelation and use that to illuminate earlier revelation. We do that with parts of the Old Testament. And I'm certainly certain, I'm certainly um, positive that biblical Unitarianism agrees that Jesus is the Messiah. But if I were to corner them on the topic and ask, how can you prove that Jesus is the Messiah using the Bible? I hope they start using the New Testament passages where Messiah is explicitly revealed as Messiah to not just Israel, but to the whole world. If they're going to try and to insinuate or imply that we cannot quote Old New Testament passages in support of understanding who Jesus is because Jesus' name doesn't show up in the Old Testament, right? If they're going to imply that reading the New Testament in support of who Jesus is is reading back into the Old Testament something that isn't sound interpretive method. I hope they're not using that um, uh, understanding of showing who Jesus truly is. Yes, it's a little more difficult and challenging to find the Messiah in the Old Testament if you've never done this without using the New Testament. But guess what? It can be done. You can see Yeshua in the Old Testament. Yeshua himself did it. He exegeted himself from the Old Testament for those first century Jewish people who didn't have a New Testament writing at the time. Right? We know that from reading through the Gospels. And if he can do it, then we can do it too. So, yes, we can use the Old Testament exclusively to find the Messiah. But the point I'm trying to make is that we don't have to go through that grueling exercise if, if, it's, not, if it's not necessary. We can use the New Testament to support the Old Testament texts. I mean, you can work them uh, in concert with one another. So they don't work against one another. They work together. So we definitely want to be using the New Testament and the Old Testament with one another. Got questions? Um... Uh, continues. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? Our familiar John 1.1 1, 1 verse. There are three important things in this passage about Jesus and the Father. Number one, Jesus was in the beginning. Right? Remember Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning. He was present at creation. Jesus had existed eternally with God. Remember my chart again? Creator, creation, or creator, and everything else. And uh, so two, Jesus is distinct from the Father. He was with God in the beginning. And then number three, Jesus is the same as God in nature. He was as to very nature God. If we were to take the kind of the the um uh the real import of that Greek word in the phrase uh in the beginning, God, I'm sorry, uh in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, right? Um 
the the, the Greek supports a, 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 a definition that would supply that as to his nature, all that the word, all that God was, the word was as well, right? To us, to his very nature, the word was defined as full deity, full, fully God as well. Uh, God questions uh, continues. Hebrews 1, 2 says, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. Christ is the agent of God's creation. The world was created through him. The Father and the Son had two distinct functions in creation, yet worked together to bring about the cosmos. So we're talking about a little bit of agency going on. I understand that, and I will even allow for that. Jesus was the agent that God used to bring the creation into existence. But we still have to realize that the verses that we're, that we're looking at define Jesus on the side of creatorship. Even if he's agent, it doesn't put him on the side of created. He's not part of the created thing because it says all things were created through him, through him, through whom he also made the universe. Even if we say, well, he wasn't God, he's just an agent. Well, I'm here to tell you that the agent is God in this particular example, right? The angel of the Lord is the Lord. He is an agent, but he's more than an agent. He speaks as God because he is God. He speaks for God because, um, and he speaks as God because his identity, his nature is very deity. It's the same as God in that sense. But when you say, well, it's a separate agent, those of you who are fond of saying, well, the angel of the Lord is a separate agent from God, Aha! You're simply agreeing with we Trinitarians when we talk about more than one person. So thank you for recognizing that the angel of the Lord, the agent of God, if Jesus is just an agent or if he is an agent of God when it came to creating, thank you for recognizing that there are more than one person when it comes to the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son. One God, two different persons. Yeah, I can agree with that. All right, so they talk about um, uh, the, uh, the Father and Son are, had two distinct functions when bringing about together the cosmos. Uh, all things were made through Jesus, and without um, Jesus was not anything made that was made, John 1, 3. Right? That's the way it works. Without the Word, not anything was made that was made. That's how we know that the Word on our little chart with Creator and, and everything else, that the Word belongs on the Creator side. Why? Because not anything was made that was made. It doesn't say that God created Jesus and then Jesus created everything. Show me that verse. Someone please show me the verse where it says God created Jesus and then Jesus created everything else. I know what you're going to do. You're going to sneak in that verse where it says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, right? In um, Colossians or you're going to, I think it's Colossians, or you're going to sneak in that verse uh, out of Revelation, the book of Revelation where it talks about he's the of the, the, the first of God's creation or something like that. But you need to go back and do your homework and look up the Greek words and find out how the interpretation of those passages doesn't lend the support for an understanding that God is creating Jesus. Instead, when it mentions the word creation and the word um, firstborn or something like that in the same verse in relationship to Yeshua, it's talking about the preeminent one who's over all creation, not the first thing that God created. So do your homework first and get back with me. Got questions? Uh, Got questions? org continues. The Apostle Paul reiterates, reiterates, quote, "There's but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live." First Corinthians eight six. By the way, as a side note, we could do an entire word study on the word Lord in the New Testament, the Greek word kudios, how it's related to the Greek, I'm sorry, how it's, how it's rooted in the Hebrew word uh, YHVH, Yahweh, the tetragrammaton name for God, and show how that by the first century, there is entirely the understanding that the Greek word kudios, as applied to Lord, carried with it um, um, uh, incarnational and uh, uh, Trinitarian uh, undertones. The idea is that um, Jesus was Lord in the sense that he is uh, the incarnation of the very uh, uh, one God that we recognize carries the name YHVH. In the Hebrew, it's yod heh vav YHVH, that we pronounce as Yahweh sometimes. Some people say Jehovah. But when we read the Bible in Greek, such as the Septuagint, like I'm going to quote from here in a moment, it ends up being kudios. And yet we call Jesus 
kudios, right? How does that factor in when we're talking about Jesus being one with the Father? And in conclusion, GodQuestions.org says, The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was also an agent in creation, Genesis 1-2, right? Remember, in Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But Genesis 1-2 goes on to say, And the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was on, was on the sur uh, surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God. Notice the kind of agency language, how the Spirit is being mentioned separate from God, the Elohim in verse 1. We've got this Ruach Elohim in verse 2, and yet it is God, and yet it's agency fashion, as in God dispatching uh, one of the persons of the Godhead to hover over the surface of the water while God remains wherever he is locally um, at, right? Wherever he's located, as if we could um, allow spirit to be spatial in that fashion. But um, Genesis 1-2, since the Hebrew word for spirit is often translated as wind or breath, we can see the activity of all three persons of the Trinity in one verse, right? By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33, 6 brings again all three in one verse. By the word of the Lord, there's Yeshua. The heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. There's the spirit. And I might add, um, even in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning, God, there's Father, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was unformed and void and darkness was on the surface of the deep. And the spirit, there's third person, of God hovered over the surface of the waters. But then Genesis 1, 3 says, and God said, and there's our word. So in Genesis 1, 2 and 3, we have the Trinity as well. So uh, their conclusion, after a thorough study of scripture, we can conclude that God the Father is the Creator, Psalm 102.25, and He created through Jesus, God the Son, Hebrews 1.2. So that's an answer I want to endorse, and that's why I read the entire answer for us right here in our um, study.